Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Dr. Matt Hunsaker, founding dean of the Medical College of Wisconsin Green Bay, and we'll discuss medical education in northeastern Wisconsin and NCW's first regional campus, which is housed in the new Gale Mulva Science Center on St. Norbert College campus. Matt, welcome to the program. Good afternoon. Well, tell us a little bit about the Medical College of Wisconsin and maybe a little bit about the history and how you got here. The Medical College of Wisconsin uh, was Marquette University many years ago. Uh, in the 60s, became Medical College of Wisconsin. We're the largest medical school in the state. Uh, we train currently about 200 students, and with the addition of the campus here in Green Bay, we'll add another 25 to that, and next year, 25 at Central Wisconsin, our companion campus. Uh, our mission in building the regional campus is really to address the uh, shortages of physicians across the state. If you think of the state of Wisconsin, uh, largely the health training capacity exists in Milwaukee and Madison for mm -hmm. physicians, and historically has. In fact, it's quite surprising to people when you think about the campus opening here at St. Norbert uh, as the MCW Green Bay campus, uh, it's over 100 years ago the last time somebody built a medical school campus in the state of Wisconsin. So as we talk about change and evolution, it's an awfully long cycle uh, to address uh, that kind of evolutionary change at such a slow pace. As we think about uh, training of physicians in the state, the Wisconsin Hospital Association and others have called for an increased capacity of training physicians. We know that there are shortages both with retirement and with movement within the health system and access to care. And as we think about training uh, those additional numbers, the really focus of the campus here is training bedside clinicians in primary care, psychiatry, and shortage fields like general surgery. And that's been the focus of both our recruitment and of our curriculum. So you're looking to fill a need that is quite clear, in other words, and is becoming more obvious. Yeah, I think as we look at uh, both specialty distribution and geographic distribution, many people are surprised with two strong health sciences uh, schools, both training physicians in the state. Uh, the northern portion of the state is a health professions shortage area uh, by federal designation. And so as we look to uh, help reverse that trend, we're looking for the right student who has both the affinity for primary care or psychiatry, as well as the uh, professional trajectory that leads to a bedside career. Hopefully in the shortage areas of the state, including the areas that uh, not only surround Green Bay and central Wisconsin, but also up into the uh, northern portions of the state. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that there's a, sort of a shortage of health care. We have four hospitals here in Green Bay, and I mean, I know they draw from all over the northern tier of the state. And I, I think one of the things that when you look about uh, look at health care. You're looking at regions of care. And although we see ourselves clearly as Wisconsin, many of the people from uh, the Upper Peninsula and areas uh, reaching farther than 30, 40, 50 miles out come to Green Bay for specialty services and specialty care. And then there are those who the care does not exist locally that go out to one of the academic medical centers, uh, both being located in the southern part of the state. So I think what we're looking to do is leverage that excellence in health care through our uh, both our clinical and academic partners, and build a world-class medical education close to home for students who perhaps don't want to uh, pull up their roots here and go to training uh, either in Madison or Milwaukee. Well, people tend to stay where they've been trained, right? I mean, they tend to, if you, if you get a med school education here, you're more likely to stay here. Is that right? That's the well, We know philosophy. from national and international data that uh, graduates tend to gravitate back to areas of training or remain in areas of training might be a better way to say it. So in the state of Wisconsin, the data shows us that if you do med school and residency in the state, about 80% of those people are retained within the state for practice. That said, we're really looking to affect geographic distribution. And we know that the origin of a student, where they're from, as well as their exposures in their younger years, often drive their choice of location for uh, both adult life and in the case of physicians, practice location. So we're hoping to leverage those factors in a similar way that others have done across the country. Um, how do you attract uh, physicians here? I mean, if you're a physician, you can go almost anywhere. Why, why here? I think that uh, one of the portions of the equation that we're looking at is how do we sell Green Bay and the region uh, as a place greater than a single um, 
concept of a sporting team or the other elements and really focus on uh, we have those things, but it's really a great place to live. Uh, unfortunately, we get portrayed in the national media, it's usually surrounding sporting events and how cold, how fierce the weather might be. Uh, but when you think about our year-round climate here in the region and across the northern part of the state, it's very amenable to a quality lifestyle. And I think as we talk about attracting physicians, we have the goal to both uh, try and bring new talent in who might not have considered Green Bay, but we're also looking for the student where this is home, where the state is home, mm -hmm. and we can leverage that um, learning equation that takes the uh, student with the academic horsepower, puts them in the driver's seat in a regionally based curriculum, and helps build that mentorship, exposure, and high quality education that leads to successful practice. So you're the dean of the school. What does a med school dean do exactly? Well, in my case as founding dean, uh, everything's been on the table from bricks and mortar to evolving the curriculum to uh, working with the admissions team to identify students and build those admissions criteria, uh, all the way through to the community work. One of the elements that is often overlooked when you're building a campus is the Medical College of Wisconsin is certainly the brand and the team that's bringing the college, but the college is being built here for the community and with the community. So much of the work we've done over the last year is building the uh, involvement of the community, whether that's in the admissions and uh, selection of students, all the way through the advisory board, philanthropy and the other elements that really make us part of the community that is uh, Northeast Wisconsin. I mean, you guys had a ton of applications for not a lot of spots. I suppose that's not surprising, but uh, talk about that a little bit. I mean, I guess, in, and more in general, why do so many people want to be doctors? I think there's a, you know, in, in a general way, uh, medicine is a field that is different than all others. Despite the pressures of federal regulation and changes in health system and payer mix and all of those things, medicine is still one human being helping another human being in its rawest form. So we ask a, a student who has the affinity and aptitude and interest to choose medicine, but we have to develop the cognitive aspects of that, the knowledge base, but also the non-cognitive aspects of the healing art of listening and touching, compassion, empathy, the domains that are perhaps uh, must be demonstrated to students and adopted by the student rather than taught. You can teach about them as principles, but really you have to mentor those qualities and they have to be displayed by those who teach. And, we think that's an element that we can leverage from the high quality care here in the community to not only build very competent knowledge, uh, mature physicians, but also those who have a high quality of practice at the bedside. And that's often gauged best by the patient, how they understand, was the communication thoughtful? Did I understand my diagnosis, what my options are? All of those elements that when you leave that visit, that was between two people. And I think lots of people are drawn to that uh, where you're able to help, where you're able to be in somebody's life for that element that is perhaps one of the more uh, unfortunate or fortunate episodes that is a life-defining moment in their life and provide that assistance as they uh, are involved in that continuum from you know sunrise when you're born to the sunset at the end of life. Physicians are a part of that. And people who have a service orientation and a scientific interest, that's a great fit for a professional career. And, you know, so I grew up on a steady diet of, uh, you know, Marcus Welby, uh, who was, you know, kind of the homespun guy. And that sort of morphed, at least the popular culture, morphed into more of the, the masters of all things scientific. And uh, you need to kind of thread the needle, right? I mean, there are some people that need, need to really be those great scientists. And there are other people that need to be great with people that have a great understanding of science and that's two different things right yeah and I, I think you know it speaks to the level of interest we've had for the campus we run a world-class academic medical center in Milwaukee what we're building here in Green Bay is the complementary piece of that equally world-class but we're looking at the student who wants to practice at the bedside not the PhD MD researcher not the super subspecialist but really the generalist that works from the spectrum of prevention all the way through disease treatment, as well as compassionate care at the end of life. So we're training a complementary uh, portion of the scope of medical uh, practitioner as a physician. So we want to make sure that we've got the elements right. We certainly have the backing, support, and referral ability to a, a very you know, well thought of medical center in Milwaukee, and we are part of that team. 
and we have not lost sight of that. But we believe that leveraging the strength of academic medical center, the expertise in teaching, with the strength and expertise of the community and training people who will not only fit in as a practitioner here, but have the high quality skills to be successful. That's really where the, I think, the value proposition for building a regional campus is. It, you know, I, I find it interesting because I know that we at St. Norbert, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to educate undergraduates for an active career of 50 years. In some ways, you're doing the same thing, only it's more targeted. Given all the changes that are happening in, in medicine, I mean, that's a daunting task. I mean, how do you prepare a young person, obviously bright, obviously hardworking, for a world that I'm not sure any of us can really figure out what is what it's going to look like in 20 years, let alone 50. I mean, yeah. how, how do you how do you get after that? I, I think the challenge is really, as you say, a daunting one. But there are some elements to the process that are key. As you've watched our building and our uh, program come together here at uh, you know MCW Green Bay, we've not built lecture pits with the mm -hmm you know, the sage on the stage at the bottom and 40 rows of uh, lecture. We've built a digital classroom, heavy in technology, heavy in the ability to leverage the future in medical care, while not focusing on computers for computer's sake, but being aware of the fact that computers are part of the practice of medicine, automation, communication, data retrieval, and knowledge. Uh, when I was a student, uh, many years ago now, we had uh, tables full of books and curriculum now that fits in my iPad and certainly in a laptop. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at a different teaching model because we know the professional of the future will have to have all of those skills that are high quality technical skills, high quality knowledge, as well as the empathy and all the things we've talked about is, that are key to the practice of medicine. The other thing that we really have to focus on is because medicine is always changing, there is the need for the physician to be self-teaching so how you stay current is when you see that patient with something that you haven't seen for a while and you need to review that information, you've got to have the self-teaching skills to know where that medicine information is, to retrieve it, to apply it to your patient, and also to make sure that you can work with others as a team effectively in an interdisciplinary way to make sure the best health outcomes are available to the patient. I mean, the team concept, I think, is, is maybe something a lot of folks don't understand. Um, it seems like the family practice person is turning into um, sort of the, the tour guide in some ways, right? I mean, they're the first, that's the primary relationship, but the, the primary care person is the one that helps them get through all the people and all the offices and all the processes and stuff that have to happen when they get sick. I might reframe it a little differently than tour guide. I think the physician that you develop that personal relationship is not only uh, a very talented medical professional, but they are also the person to help you navigate what is a very complicated system. We think back 100 years ago, you went to the hospital to die. Mm -hmm. Now, much of what we do is outpatient and requires coordination not only of the physician, but of uh, nurses and allied health professionals. And the scope of practice and what each of those fields do has largely changed in the last two decades. Interestingly enough, there was a time when the physician in his office owned the x-ray equipment, read the x-ray, ran the lab work, did the microscopy, mm -hmm. and from door to door, the visit was a one-on-one -on -one visit. Uh, because we've had the evolution of fields like physical therapy, we've had the evolution of laboratory tech science and all the supporting and collaborating fields, we now are looking at a technical sophistication that it would be difficult for one individual to uh, perform in a single visit. We're also looking at what is the way that a team gets the best value for the patient, not in a dollar value alone, but actually in a health outcomes value. How do we work together to each of us at the highest level of the training of our licensure and certification to really bring that patient to the place where they're getting the best treatment, the best communication, the right person's delivering the message at the right time, uh, to just ensure that we're doing all we can to uh, help people live longer and feel better, because that's really what we do. And, and I've spoken to a lot of fairly senior people in the healthcare systems around here over the last couple of years, and uh, there are new federal regulations that really hold how much they can bill, how much the systems can bill to some measure of patient satisfaction. Everybody's scrambling about what is good care, what does that mean? Is it great if we 
you know, if, if we cure whatever the patient had, but they feel miserable about it, is it good if they feel great, but you know, they don't get cured? I mean, I mean, there's so many dimensions upon which these these metrics have to be developed that I, I think it's just bewildering for somebody who is a practicing physician, let alone somebody who's trying to prepare somebody for that for that world. I, th I think we're looking at a different student as well, but. Mm -hmm. uh, to your point about the complexity, certainly the complexity of a number of people involved, whether it's the government or insurance companies or regulators, uh, has, has changed. But in the end, we come back to uh, the best decisions for the patient at the bedside and no single factor, whether it's the cost of care, the effectiveness of the treatment, uh, the desire of the patient or the desire of the physician should drive the equation. It should be a balance mm -hmm. of all of those factors. Um, because we have science, sometimes we have to make the decision not to use science because it only prolongs life. The same is true as we think about interventions at the beginning of life. Where does life begin? Where does life end? Uh, where does dignity play a role in managing care? Uh, as well as when we need the high quality genetic research so that a child who has a life-threatening illness can get a 24-hour DNA diagnosis and walk out of the hospital a few months later that's a pretty amazing technological advance that was not available two years ago, 10 years ago. And I think that's really the strength of training somebody in a regional campus that has an awareness of the strength of our uh, academic medical center. That referral process, that connectedness to a larger infrastructure means that the physician is not the lone practitioner out mm -hmm. somewhere far away, detached from the system, but that same MRI can be looked at digitally by one of our high quality team in uh, the academic medical center, one of our local partners, and we can coordinate that care, whether it's uh, diagnosis there and treatment here, collaboration on the diagnosis across multiple sites. That's really the exciting piece that we're training somebody to work across a system that, you're right, we don't know what it will be tomorrow, let alone 10 or 15 years from now. But if we train the student right, they'll not only function well in that environment, but they'll thrive because they have both the self-teaching skills the coordination interprofessional skills, and the professional respect that each member of the team is a valued member. I think that's true, although I, I would get nervous if I found my doctor on WebMD looking up my symptoms. That well, would make me that. We use a little <laughs> different resources than that, but I think the, the idea is there that where we used to have to search through the shelf of books, mm -hmm. we can retrieve things at the fingertips, medication interactions, and uh, even survey articles of the most re recent information. Mm -hmm. There was a time in medicine where uh, best practices in science took about 17 years to get to the bedside. That cycle is less now, but still we're trying to get to where the best available information for the patient's illness is available in a relatively quick manner. We use in medicine uh, the translational science approach where we think that we're taking something that exists and moving very quickly to where that impacts a, a patient's survival, wellness, or return to health. And uh, when we say clinical translational science, that's what we're talking about, where high quality research finds its way, in, its way into treatment and uh, helps preserve patient outcomes. I mean, I was just reading uh, the other day that um, I think now that the life chances of preemies born as early as 22 weeks are looking much better than they were even a few years ago. I, I, it, it, it's astounding at how quickly this stuff comes about. The other thing, of course, is just because you know it's in it's in a newspaper article, doesn't necessarily mean that you fully un understand the complexities of what go into that. Okay, so here's someone that had an X Y Z transplant. That doesn't mean everyone can can have something like that. That's got to be hard for the practicing physician. And, and speaking of that, before you got into this, you were a practicing physician. Is that is that right? That's correct. I'm a family doc by training, and I also hold some other certificates and. Uh, as part of my practice, it was in full scope family medicine, delivering babies and taking care of children, internal medicine, hospital practice, all of those things. Uh, uh, I was most recently at the University of Illinois for about a decade, uh, running a rural medicine programs as well as some other administrative responsibilities. So I feel like I have a, a good sense of what it's like to be the practitioner, what it's like to have that grounding in medical education, and then also uh, be evolving it from a technical aspect using the digital classroom and the technologies that'll give students really a leg up in their education and their future. So I feel well grounded in that. 
Do you expect a lot of the folks uh, up here are going to wind up in the highly rural areas? No, I think uh, although we're aware of the rural areas, our focus is not exclusively rural. We're working so that students from Wisconsin who are interested in being in the region uh, across the state of Wisconsin, as well as our shortage areas, are well equipped to go there if they so choose. We certainly have a focus on primary care, psychiatry, and the other things that are critical shortages, but we want to be sure that um, we're not driving the choice of specialty uh, by anything other than the student's affinity. We want them to be well equipped so that they could choose any field they want, and indeed the academic rigor is equal to that of any other training, uh, but that their personal preference and interest are well aligned with the campus goals and uh, they'll be able to achieve their professional aspirations. Well, let me shift gears a little bit and talk about another one of your passions, which is flying. You're a pilot. I am. So how did, how did that happen? You know, I've been flying about uh, a little over 20 years. Uh, had an interest in flying from when I was a young man, uh, but had a lot of distractions with work and things. So uh, as I was in finishing medical school and beginning residency, I took flying lessons and actually learned to fly. I also serve as a FAA Airman Medical Examiner, and uh, so I do medical exams on pilots. And I also handle some of the more difficult cases when we have pilots who are either uh, suffering from mental illness issues or substance abuse issues that are involved in a lot of those cases. But flying is one of those things for me that is, um, takes all of the technical aspects of, uh, you know, physics and, uh, you know, motors and all of the things that are uh, outside of medicine interesting to me and combines them into a uh, highly precise um, ability to go places and do things and enjoy things that I might not be able to do if I was driving there. For me, uh, when I was young in practice, it was often the difference between attending a graduation or a wedding that was many hours away of one of my college friends, but I could get in the plane, be there in a couple hours, attend something, be home the next day, and uh, be able to be a part of their lives, but uh, not have the restriction of commercial air travel or driving there by car, which certainly uh, can be cumbersome. Well, commercial air travel is so taxing. I mean, of course, it's a very expensive hobby, I think, to, uh, to fly yourself, but it's very freeing, I'm guessing. You just basically come in, park your plane, and get off. No security, you know, uh, uh, none of that, right? Yeah, well, there is some security, and there are elements, you know, of uh, private uh, travel in a plane. Uh, but I think one of the things that really opens up to you is places that commercial airports don't go. You can fly to uh, Mackinac Island. You can fly up mm. uh, to Washington Island. You can go places that otherwise uh, are harder to reach, but by air they're available. I think also the interesting thing about flying for me is that it provides you the opportunity um, to meet people who have similar interest in travel and exploration, and it provides that element of the unknown that you can manage the risk through precision and training and currency. Uh, but there's something really exciting about uh, flying somewhere you've never been into a remote location. Uh, I also have a seaplane rating, and the most exciting oh, thing really? to me was to land on a lake where very people have been very few people have been with friends and meet some others there and seaplane and just be able to enjoy that which is uh, not available to everyone in uh, you know, a way that uh, is um, easy to access. That must scare the hell out of the ducks when you come in. I, <laughs> you're, you're the alpha duck. <laughs> I, I think uh, the farther out you get, the more interesting and exciting places become. And the more untouched, I think, when you fly into a small lake in Canada that is uh, pretty remote. The wilderness is the way it once was all over the North American continent, and uh, that's a pretty neat thing to spend the night on the shores of a, a lake where there's not a lot of people and the animals really roam uh, in wildlife, in the way that wildlife in, should be. That must be cool. Well, now you've also done some other travel too, if I'm not mistaken. You've, um, you've done some medical education and other kinds of help in Thailand is one place, right? It, it, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, as a part of my work at uh, University of Illinois, I was both a uh, U.S. Uh, State Department Fulbright Specialist in medical education and uh, also helped with a project with Princess of Narodawa University, helping build the uh, program there. Uh, the, to me, the work in Thailand was uh, among those which have been personally most important. Uh, we worked to build a school much like our rural medicine program taking students from non-traditional backgrounds who have the aptitude and interest to become physicians. The unique thing is that in the place we built the school in Thailand is at the Thai-Malaysian border 
so when you hear about conflict and separatist movements in the south of Thailand, it's really the environment in which we were able to build a school that embraced not only medical education, but brought together pretty diverse cultures that have some uh, significant uh, avarice and frustration with each other for many, many years. Uh, it was, for me, very rewarding to see the school as an agent of change among people's children who were studying side by side, whether they were Muslim or Buddhist, uh, and uh, in a way that culturally they had not interacted in many occasions in the past. Well, I think for most Americans, um, this really came home that we have differential health care than other places during the recent Ebola uh, situation. And I think, um, you know, there was quite the debate about the medical workers going there and coming back and quarantine and all that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's quite a commitment if you're heading to a place like that to, uh, to try to help people out. I, can, I can't even imagine. Yeah, I think Dr. Brantley and others uh, take on a special risk to help other people and lessen suffering around the globe. Certainly the work I've done has never been of that level of risk. Uh, but I think we hold a special place for people who are willing to set aside their own uh, professional success and find that success uh, not in a financial way, but at the bedside of the most marginalized and at-risk people in all of uh, the planet. And uh, the other element of that is we once were uh, the United States. We now live in a global world with millions of people coming and going from the country each day in air travel and crossing our borders. And uh, whatever our individual or personal feelings about immigration, migration, and travel are, uh, we live in a world where disease is not a single entity, a single country, but really professionals are addressing uh, issues that had never occurred in the United States. When we think about Ebola being around for you know, two decades uh, or more, we, we start to think, well, we never thought we'd have cases here. Mm -hmm. And suddenly at your doorstep is a life-threatening illness and there are Americans involved, there are immigrants involved, there is exposure to healthcare workers. And we want to make sure that students have that um, awareness and that ability to work in that environment if called to do so. And it also causes us to look at team structure how do we support each other and identify the sickest patients early and cooperate to make sure that the proper care is given while not exposing healthcare workers as well? Right. I mean, uh, when there's some scary things, and most of us would prefer not to think about it. There could be some, you know, global epidemic. Uh, there are concerns about uh, antibiotics and their ineffectual, uh, eventual ineffectual uh, use. What, what what keeps you awake at night? I, you know, I, I try not to let any particular element of suffering around the globe um, keep me awake. But when I think about care, we often focus on the marketplace of care. Uh, as Americans, we have clean water. You know, rarely you could think about in the United States a place where tap water is undrinkable. There are places, but they are not common. I think we have to ask ourselves as, um, as individuals, as human beings, where in the world can we affect small changes that healthcare can thrive, not with our colonial efforts, but where we build infrastructure, education, and programs that are sustainable? Uh, whether we're talking about a health profession shortage area in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. or whether we're talking about building a med school in Tanzania or uh, rural Thailand, those are the places where our investments as humankind will drive the relief of suffering, the promotion of health, and also um, the equality among peoples in terms of survival and uh, uh, really a, a better global client. You know, it's hard to imagine if you look at um, lifespans and how they've changed in the last hundred years or so. Um, of course, there's a lot of, you know, debate about all the terrible things that we do to our environment as a result of, you know, the, the industrial processes. But it's hard to argue that uh, there haven't been a lot of good things that have come along with it. Well, we're certainly at St. Norbert uh, thrilled to be a part of what it is that you guys are doing uh, on our campus, and uh, we look forward to seeing a lot of future doctors wandering, uh, wandering around the green, ivy-covered uh, areas that we have. Matt, thank you so much for um, being with us today, and you know, thanks for your insights. I've really enjoyed this. My pleasure. And I hope you've all enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.